Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. We're continuing our walk through the sanctuary. This is the fourth part. And we are looking at, we are in the midst of looking at justification by faith. And justification by faith, as, as you remember, if you've been following this, if you haven't, highly encourage you to at least start this section. There's obviously, there's a lot. But we've gone through every aspect uh, that we can of the sanctuary, the furniture, the the different offerings, the different ceremonies, the feast days, and the prophetic fulfillment, everything you can think of. We've gone over the the materials that were used, uh, why they were used that way. And now what we're looking at is your spiritual walk, because as we go through the sanctuary, the sanctuary is set up as an object lesson. As we move closer to God, closer to the Shekinah glory, and we see the process by which he sanctifies us, and he removes sin from the sinner and separates sin from the sinner for all time. And this message in particular, justification by faith, this is the message that Mrs. White said would reinvigorate the Seventh-day Adventists at the end of time. Justification by faith. Not, it, it encompasses sanctification by faith and glorification by faith as well. It's righteousness by faith, in other words. But it all starts at justification by faith. This is the first love that we've lost. Paul, you want to add something real quick? Uh, Bill's got. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. But what does John call justification by faith? There's a specific thing for it, for our time. It is, John has this in the book of Revelation. Faith of Jesus. It's the third angel's message. That's right. Period. It's the third angel's message. And that's what seventh, yeah, seventh day Adventists cannot understand. That goes back to Melchizedek. Justification by faith. That goes all the way back to Genesis and Melchizedek. That's what that was all about. Amen. So, with that, folks, let's have a word of prayer as we get started. Father in heaven, Lord, we pray. We pray for your truth this morning. We pray for not a form of godliness that denies your power, but we pray for your power, for your gospel, to change our hearts, Lord, to guide us and walk us through the sanctuary as we move closer and closer towards you and your perfection. Help us, Lord, to look into that mirror and to behold the law of God to see who we truly are and then look unto Christ and behold him and see what we can be. We pray, Lord, that we would reflect his character and be your witnesses in this world. Help us this morning, Lord. We ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask you to bless the listeners, to bless the speaker, as we go through this process that the Apostle Paul calls the foolishness of preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, Pastor Hughes, go ahead. Cody, you know that, that term justification by faith. I, I love the statement that Ellen White makes in Testimonies to Ministers where she says, what is justification by faith? She says, it is the laying of the glory of man in the dust and God doing for man what he cannot do for himself. It's unlocking, it's unlocking the power of God to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. That's, right. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Easy to say, hard to do. Hard to do. Paul, you want to add something else? One more quick comment. I've got a lot of things to get to. <clears throat> Also, this goes along with miss the statement that the work will be finished by men of no reputation. Because that means all the theologians, all the educated, the scholars will be laid in the dust. And if you follow them, there's no justification by faith. It's strictly between us and Christ. And Adventists can't stand that. Just like the first century church. Do you realize that at the special resurrection, it will be Seventh-day Adventists? that are coming back to watch Christ come, whom they betrayed 
and crucified. That's what we have right now, that same mentality, because it was justification by faith. It will be Seventh-day Adventists that will be called back in the special resurrection with exception of a few. Very, very good point, very good point. And this kind of comes into what we've been talking about, started talking about last time, which was the, the relationship of faith and works and what that means. Because as Pastor Hughes said in his comment, it is the laying down of the glory of man in the dust, right? And having God do something for us, in us, that we can't do for ourselves. The, the, the problem is, is that we have to make a choice to do that. That's an easy thing to say. It's a very hard thing to do because that means each and every morning you have to crucify yourself. Each and every morning you're born with the same devilish version of yourself that you had the day before, and the day before that, and the day before that. All your problems, all your tendencies to evil, they're right there at the door, and they're right there with you when you wake up. And so you might have this outward facade. You might be a good person. You might be a good citizen of the United States or wherever you're from. But God knows your heart. He knows if you have resentments. These are the things that most Seventh-day Adventists don't talk about. Have you given your heart to the Lord? Because that is the new covenant, isn't it? He says, I will write my laws upon your heart. How can he write his law on your heart if you haven't given him your heart? He can't do it. So do you have resentments from the past? Do you have problems with people that are unresolved, harms that you've committed against them that you, you should say um, at least apologize for them, give them a call and apologize? Do you, have, do, you, do, you, do you reserve the right to be angry and irritated towards people? You can't. You can't have those things because you can't bring those things into heaven. That's a tall order, right? Now you see what I'm talking about because Mrs. White says the character is the thoughts and the feelings combined, not the actions, not the actions, because we can control our actions to a certain degree, but only God can read our heart. So I got to ask you guys, are, are you giving your hearts to the Lord each and every morning and crucifying self? Or do your prayers sound repetitious? Do they sound same? Do they sound bland? Do they sound ritualistic? Because if you're not pouring out your heart to the Lord and giving him your heart each and every morning, he can't, he can't put in you the justification by faith, the sanctification by faith. He can't give you his righteousness. And you think, wow, how could I ever reach this mark? Well, we're going to start with something that we've been reading every single time so far. This is from Sons and Daughters of God, May 27th, page 154. The first, we started with how God draws us. He draws us to his sanctuary. You could be out in Egypt, and perhaps you're in the camp, but you're, you're backslidden in some way. He draws you through his law, through the message of judgment, and through his love. Those are the two ways. The desire to be saved alone will not save you. It can't, because there's no power in it. The power of the gospel is actuated by love. Love is the catalyst. It's a faith that works by, how does it work? Love. love, and purifies the soul. So basically, you rise, you stand or fall on, the, on whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, whether you love him, whether you love him enough to lay down your life for him, to, to, to lay all your idols before his feet and say, take them. That's love. That's relationship. You see, the people that are going to be in heaven, I've said this before, the people that are going to be in heaven are going to be people that wouldn't want to be in heaven if Jesus wasn't there. Pe heaven is not going to be filled with a bunch of people that wanted to be saved. If that were the case, the whole world would be there. But you say it's a tall order, so let's think about the Lord's pity for us as we go through this process. Our work is to strive to attain in our sphere of action the perfection that Christ in his life on earth attained in every phase of character. To go forward without stumbling, we must have the assurance that a hand all-powerful will hold us up. And listen to this. And an infinite pity be exercised toward us if we fall. God alone can at all times hear our cry for help. 
anybody who's been a Christian for some time, has fallen many, many times. The Lord, that's between you and the Lord. We think many times we've gone too far. The Lord can't forgive us. Maybe, maybe because we, we, think, we think in such humanistic ways, we think about a relationship we were having with somebody. If you had cheated on them this many times, <laughs> they'd be gone, right? They would walk away, and they'd be right to do so. However, what does the word infinite mean? There's no beginning and no end. No beginning, no end. As long as you are fighting, as long as you are pouring out your heart to the Lord, He understands we have struggles. He understands we have problems. But perfection is the goal. And it is an attainable goal. And he, he offers us the power to reach that goal. That's why the third angel's message, it talks about the mark of the beast. That stuff's important. It talks about all this stuff. But at the end, it ends with those who keep the commandments of God. How? Through the faith of Jesus. Righteousness by faith. Paul, you want to add something? You know, Cody, you said something that's very important. This all hinges off love. But what is the definition of love today? Yes. And that's going around the churches because Mrs. White says that this will be akin to spiritualism when not understood because with love, there's also a penalty. Right. Well, we don't recognize that anymore. It's this stupidity that goes with the emotional yes. instead of intellectual. And Jesus is talking, the Holy Spirit, here about intellectual love. Exactly. The love of keeping God's commandments right. and serving uh, him. Like Paul says, a slave to righteousness. Like a, a committed love. Yes. A, 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 when you know that your, your spouse, perhaps, because that's probably the easiest one for us to understand, right? But your spouse does something. You don't love them in that moment, right? Not all the time. But you choose to love them, right? <laughs> you choose to love them. That's a commitment. And that's what we looked, when we looked at last time, we looked at the, the very well-known um, uh, passage from Scripture. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, and have ever, uh, but should have everlasting life. The word believe is not simply an acknowledgement of a fact. It's also, it also means commitment and trust. So when you, when you have faith, it's something that you exercise. Let me give you an example. I think I've given this one in the past. You have two men. All right? They're in the exact same situation. They're flying, they're flying a plane in the air, and their gas gauge was broken. So they thought they were full. But they're actually almost completely empty. The first engine stalls out. He sees it. He's very high up. He's over the mountains. There's a little valley in front of him that has a small landing strip on it. He has a very slim chance. He sees, he looks at the gauge, and he sees the gauge go from full to empty. It finally figures it out. His left engine stalls out. Now, he has to either glide it in or die. The man who has a faith, this is the, the proper relationship of faith and works. Someone who has faith without works will drop, drop the controls, go to the back of the plane, get on their knees, and beg God to save them. The person who has a faith that works by love and purifies the soul they will be begging God while they are hanging on and trying to guide that plane into land. That's the difference. That's the difference. And that's what we need to be. And infinite pity will be exercised towards us. Steps to Christ, which is really the book on this, Steps to Christ, walking through the sanctuary towards God. Steps to Christ, page 44 through 45, says this. And this is a warning, folks. The desire to be saved alone. If that, that's a good starting point for people. That's why we have the messages of judgment. Because people, they, they get convicted of it. And then they say, what shall I do to be saved? And then you show them the way to walk in. Right? Me and my wife, we call them sexy videos. Right? If we post something about the Jesuits or something like that, we know we're going to get a lot of views. 
If we post something about Jesus' life, we're not going to get as many views. But which one's going to save your soul? The one about Jesus, right? The, 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 the ones about conspiracy, they're important. It's important to understand history, but they're meant to whet the appetite for someone to say, okay, something's very wrong here. What shall I do to be saved? How can I be right with God? But as, as you walk, as you continue your walk, you have to have a relationship with Christ. Love, love, real love, not, not the sentimentalism that we have nowadays. That has to be the, the binder on your life to keep bringing you through step by step, closer and closer to Jesus. This is what it says. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to b obey his law, to, to form a right character and secure salvation. They want to be saved, right? They want to be saved. They're honest. They want to be saved. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. They want to be saved but they're not letting God's love actuate them. Such religion is worth nothing. When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love, with the joy of communion with him, that it will cleave to him. And in the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. Love to Christ will be the spring of action. That's justification by faith. A relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, how do, you, how, do you continue to, how do you continue to foster a relationship with Jesus after you've started it? You have to spend time with him, right? If you're in a marriage, you have to spend time with the person that you love to keep, to keep it cultivated, to keep it fresh. Otherwise, it starts to die, right? You have to continue feeding it, right? If you don't feed something... Might be some time, but they'll die eventually. That relationship will die. So how do, we, how do we spend time with Christ? We spend time with him in prayer. You have to talk to him. And the Apostle Paul says, pray without ceasing. And he doesn't mean in the worldly sense where you, where you make, make a big show of it in front of everybody and drop to your knees in front of everybody so they can see you. But like the way Nehemiah did when he was on his way to, to the Persian king knowing that he could be killed just for walking in. He was begging God. He was praying. Pray ceaselessly. So a relationship with God involves prayer, which is talking with him. It also involves devotion. Because devotion time, where you're studying the word of God, you're learning what his counsel is for you, for you personally. He loves you personally. I read a quote here a few weeks ago. I wish I had it now. That Jesus Christ would have came to earth and died for just one soul. Just one. I'd say you're pretty valuable. And not because you've done something. Right? It's kind of, it's one of those, it's one of those oxymorons, right? You're, you're worthless in the sense of, of you're, you're a sinner, you're, you're less than nothing in heaven and, 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 and in the universe. Yet, you have such great value because the Son of God died for you. What value can you place on a human being? And that's every person. That's every person. So, this message must go out to the world. Mrs. White says in Review and Herald, August 1st, 1890, she said, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. What does that mean? In truth, in the strongest form of truth. This message of justification by faith, this message of righteousness by faith, this is to empower the Seventh-day Adventists throughout the world to be able to give the rest of the third angel's message, which is the message of the mark of the beast and the second angel's message to come out of these apostate Protestant churches and the first angel's message, keeping God's law, fearing him, the proper diet, all everything that goes in that. 
This is where the power is. And when we're living in these last days, this is the message that needs, that we need to be thinking about. We need to be begging the Lord. If we're not living it yet, we need to be begging the Lord, teach me how to live righteousness by faith. Justify me by faith, Lord. Help me to have faith which I lack. Because faith is not something we have within ourselves. It's something he gives to us. Paul, you want to add something? Yeah. yeah. One other thing about the third angel's message, it also carries the penalty for not doing this. It's That's right. the end. Even in a relationship, there is a tolerance past which the Lord does not expect either spouse to go. There is a time when a letter of divorce can be given. That's right. What is it for? Adultery, infidelity. So Seventh-day Adventists who think, oh, I don't have to do this in church anymore. I don't have to act like this in public. Well, what's the difference being a peculiar people? Elijah, Elijah, uh, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, they were all outcasts from Seventh-day Adventist society because of the way they lived. Jesus, and when the apostles, be, uh, the disciples became apostles, they were outcasts from the church. Oh, we don't have to kneel when we pray anymore. We don't have to go before the Lord with our best anymore. This is ecumenism, and it's downright satanic delusion because we're not giving Christ his due. We're not giving the Father. We're not going before the king of the universe when we come dressed or look. And I'm not picking on anybody or looking like the rest of the world when they go to church. We have deteriorated so bad. I remember when I was a kid, you didn't get in the door. Okay? And I'm saying there's extremes. But yeah. the third angel's message carries the penalty for violating the love. And you know, we can't say these things because it offends. I'm tired of hearing about offending because I've offended God all my life and he's tolerated me with infinite love. So this is the thing, man-made rules, gotta go. Otherwise, you're given a letter of divorce and you're gonna end up in the lake of fire. Serious. Amen. There is a point of no return even in our lives. Um, Saul reached that point. Yeah, Moving on, the, uh, this is from Testimonies of the Church, Volume 6, page 19. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare, why? To prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. This message that I'm telling you right now, righteousness by faith, this is the message that will close the work. How is it, how is it actuated? Through love. Through love. We have to give our hearts fully to him. The Apostle Paul explains this. I read this last time, but I'll read it again. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 through 21. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are, uh, also are found sinners, there is therefore Christ, the minister of sin, God forbid. Do you hear what he's saying? Do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying that if you take on Christ's righteousness, and then you say, well, God loves me, so I can, I can sin, and you're saying that? That means you're making Christ the minister of sin. He is the minister for sin, not, not to take away from sin but for sin, to give excuses for it. God forbid, the Apostle Paul says. So there will be a change. There will be a change internally. You, you are the one who has to give up everything, who has to give up those. You know what your heart sins are. You know what your tendencies are. You know, you know it could be something outward. It could be something like caffeine or overeating or something. It could be something like that. Pornography in this day and age, so many men are struggling with. It could be something like that, but it also could be something... Resentment, anger, intolerance, hatred. Something that is surging through your body that never 
necessarily comes out in the open. Those you have to lay before him. And then you will be able to keep God's law. And you won't make excuses for sin. You see, when you see ministers making excuses for sin and saying you should be saved to sin, you know what they are? They're making Christ a minister of sin. It goes on, it says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, who loved me, and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness cometh by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He's trying to overcome this, I, this concept of wanting to be saved, right? Wanting to be saved and then just trying to keep the law. That's not, if that's where you're at, it's not going to save you. You have to go deeper. You have to really take a strong moral inventory and say, what is my real relationship with Christ? What is my real Christianity worth? And be honest with yourself. But where does works play into that? Does that mean we have no works of the law? Absolutely not. We do have them. But who gets the glory for them? God, because who's really doing them? They're his works, right? We've just made the decision to surrender to him. So we're saved by grace through faith to do good works. So many people read, so many people read this section and they don't, they don't read the, the following verses. So let's read the whole thing together. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 through 10. It says, That in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, that means I can sin, right? Because I'm saved by grace. It continues. It says, For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus. So it's talking about the second creation, not the first, right? It's talking about the new heart, right? It's talking about after you've given yourself, after you've surrendered to the Lord. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There will be works. There will be works in your life. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So Christ has, or God has ordained good works to be in us once we've given our heart to the Lord. So if we don't have those, what does that mean? That we're still, we're still in control, right? That's why James says, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. I'll prove it to you. Not because, not because and he wouldn't, even he would agree, not because they're, they're necessarily truly his, his, but because he's surrendered. And he's given, his, he's given his life to the Lord, and Christ Jesus is doing these works through him. So how does it work? How do, we, how do we tap into this power so that we don't have a form of godliness, right? A, a ceremonial, ritualistic, you know, we go to church every Sabbath, we sit in the pews, we hear a message, we, we, we clock in, we clock out with God. And, you know, we've clocked in so many times and we've clocked out and we can show God, look, my card's perfect, perfect attendance. How do we tap into this power so that we don't have that form of godliness but denies the power that he wants to give us? Mrs. White tells us in Desire of Ages 668, all true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent... He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. It's a good way to check yourself, isn't it? If you're going to do something good and you're just, you're just doing it, if, and, and, and it's just impulsively happening, well, then the spirit of the Lord is there. But if you're doing this, you're like, I think this is what God wants and I better do this and you're miserable about it, yeah, your heart's wrong. I'm not saying you're going to feel good everything that you do. That's not what I'm saying. 
And you might you might loathe to do this thing. But you you know what you how your heart is communicating with the Lord. And Mrs. White says that all of us, the, the, the person, because the Holy Spirit loves us so much, he doesn't speak for himself, he keeps turning us towards Christ. Mrs. White says that the sinner knows just the sins he needs to repent of in order to be saved. So whatever you're being convicted of, you know. You don't have to tell me. I'm not a priest. Christ is your priest. Amen. Our only priest. It goes on, it says, The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. So you have to give your heart to him. All your plans to him. All your goals. All your frustrations. And I'll tell you, I've fallen a number of times because I failed to do that part. I failed to give him my burdens because I didn't want to bother him with them because I thought they were small. I thought there was something that I, I, I don't want to bother the Lord with. I'll just, I won't, I'll take it on myself. And eventually it, 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 it destroys you. You give it to him. The littlest thing, if it bothers you, give it to him. He'll take it. He is a great burden bearer. This is how, and so this, this comes up to our reading of the scriptures. Looking in, beholding. This is how we are changed. This is how it works. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we are changed by beholding. Now, the same is true on the flip side. You're changed by beholding evil. You're going you're gonna to find yourself failing to overcome if you are looking at the things of the world. If you're allowing those... Now, there's things that we can't do anything about. I, Christ understands that. I certainly understand that. But there are things that you can invite into your home. And if you're inviting those, those things into your home, you know what the devils do? Because they're very political. They turn and they look at God and they say, he's got my movies in his house. How can you say that I don't have access to him? He's got my doctrine in there. He loves my things. And God says, you're right. Go talk to him. What's going to happen if a demon comes and starts whispering in our ear? They're going to tempt us with all the things that we want. And how long can you listen to that voice before you give in? If you give in in heart, you failed. So how long can you listen to that voice? <coughs> Romans chapter 3, verse 26. It says, To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So <coughs> believing, committing to Christ. That's how we tap into that power. That's each and every day. We were just talking about this. So what are you beholding? Psalm chapter 101, verses 2 and 3, it says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. You see, if you're looking at images... If you're watching characters who do good things but have corrupt characters, you're going to be changed into the same images. You're going to be changed. Music. Music in the last days. Think about music in just, just 200 years ago. Never mind how it's changed. Let's pretend it's the same. Let's pretend it's just, just as vitriolic as it is now. You didn't have hundreds of millions of songs at your fingertips, did you? You wanted to go hear that music? You had to go to the bad part of town, which could be hours away from your house, right? You had to go to the bad part of town. You had to sit there and listen to the music when they were there to play it, right? <laughs> now what? 
It's right here. Not one song, not a hundred songs, not a million songs, billions, trillions of songs, trillions of images, trillions of men and women doing horrible things on this device right here. At your fingertips, yeah. at your children's fingertips. Yeah. You know, I have a heathenistic past. Pastor Hughes has a heathenistic past. So does Paul, especially when it comes to music. And I'll tell you, these songs sometimes pop into your head, and you can't get them out. And you know why? It's because we probably listened to them 150 times. 100, 200 years ago, you, you know how hard you'd have to work to listen to something 150 times? Play the same song again, please. You'd have to ask them personally to do it, right? Now, how many times do we hear that doctrine? How many times are we pestered with that worldly thought? And even now, even now in this day and age, when we're working throughout the week, I know it's happened to Pastor Hughes, I know it's happened to Paul, and it's certainly happened to myself. Perhaps some of you have listened to some bad music. You get these songs that pop into your head, and you can't get them out. It's powerful. Remember, before the image of Babylon was rolled out for all the Jews to bow before, when you hear all sorts of music, music bow. Paul? I know I said I wasn't going to say much, but this is serious stuff. This is... Where we live, you know, Elvis Presley made a statement, and he had a religious background, and he said, the truth is like the sun. He said, you can block it out for a little while, but it will always shine through. I wonder what he meant. I don't know what he was talking about, kind of like his life. And he was the father of what we're talking about here in the music industry. It was Elvis Presley, no yeah. doubt about it. In Orlando now, I'm sure you've seen them, and I was appalled. I haven't driven through that city in a while because I'm not working downtown in that area. Right. Now there's pictures of condoms on yes. billboards, having safe sex, two guys kissing each other up there, right there by the college out at UCF about responsible sex. I have never seen that in my life. Okay, this is what children are seeing now. It's in their libraries in the public it's, schools. Yes, well. and this is what is being presented in American cities, the most moral cities in the world. Yes, and it shows you how close we are to the end. Yeah. It shows you how close we are. Yeah, these things are right in our face. It's never been quite like this before. Every single movie, there's this super surge of woke propaganda and sexualization and it's aimed towards children now. Disney just came out with a movie. There was a, a, it's a Pixar movie and the kid in the movie has a sexual attraction. He's 12 years old and he has a, he has an attraction to a, a boy in the movie. But praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord because you know what, you know what God is allowing to happen right now? For anybody who's honest, who, who, who loves God and who's kind of on the fence here, he's making the music and the, the movie industry and even the sports industry so repulsive to us that he's breaking that connection. Are we going to reconnect with it? I mean, COVID changed everything, right? The whole world shut down for a while. There was a connection broken for a lot of people, for a lot of things. And it was for, for a lot of people, it was a good thing. A lot of people, it was bad. But for the watchers, it was a good thing. It was a wake-up call. Are we going to go back to those things if we were using them before? So how do we do this? We've talked about it. Steps to Christ, page 70. Consecrate yourselves to God in the morning. Why in the morning? Why not after breakfast? Seek him early. Why not, why, not, why not just in the evening time? <laughs> War's over, right? Right? You don't, you, don't ask for, you don't ask for ammunitions and supplies and, and men to go fight a battle after the battle's over, right? You ask for those things before. Consecrate yourselves to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Let your prayer be 
Take me, O Lord, as wholly thine. I lay all my plans at thy feet. Use me today in thy service. Abide with me and let all my work be wrought in thee. This is a daily matter. Each morning, consecrate yourself. That means dedicate yourself. Dedicate your life to God for that day. Surrender all your plans to him to be carried out or given up as his providence shall indicate. How can you get mad if something happens to you, right? If your car breaks down or something, if you've consecrated your day to him and you know that whatever happens is his plan. You see how that changes things? By relinquishing control of your life, you gain control of your life. (laughs) Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God, and thus your life may be molded more and more after the life of Christ. See, it can't be something that you do when the Sunday law comes. You're not going to flip that switch. This is a lifelong battle. That's why every single day you're chipping away, just like the, the sculptor on the rock, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, one little speck pebble at a time until the character's perfect. You have to do it every day. If you miss a day, there's infinite pity. But don't, don't, don't let yourself fail and don't just give up. Go to him. Go to him. And if you, if you can't repent, still go to him. He doesn't... Repentance is not, is not a, a prerequisite for, for being with Christ. I'm not saying you'll be saved that way. I'm saying you should go to him. You should spend time with him. He will bring you to a point of repentance because repentance ultimately comes from him. That's why we come as we are to Christ and we let him work on our hearts. Perhaps you're unrepentant and you think that I can't come to God because I haven't repented. Just go to God. Spend time with him. Continue reading your Bible. Pray that you can have repentance and he will give it to you. Amen. That's right. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Steps to Christ, page 49 and 50. This is how you exercise your faith. You have confessed your sins and in heart put them away. You have resolved to give yourself to God. Now go to him and ask that he will wash away your sins and give you a new heart. See, that new heart that he wants to give you, he'll write his law on that heart. Then believe that he does this because he has promised. This is the lesson which Jesus taught while he was on earth, that the gift which God promises us, we must believe we do receive, and it is ours. Let me stop right there real quick. So many people stumble here. They're waiting for a feeling. They're waiting for an emotional uh, tidal wave. That's not how it works. You have to exercise belief in the promises. Exactly. It doesn't matter how you feel. God's trying to get us away from that sort of thinking, feeling. That's the world's version of the love gospel. So what we have to do is we have to to take hold of his promises. And if he has promised, then it's an insult to God if we don't believe his promise. So what we do is we pray We ask for the new heart, and then we thank him for it. And then we believe that we have it, even if we don't feel the change. Exercise that faith. It's a muscle. You need to exercise it. Faith is not feeling. Faith is not feeling. Thank you. That's a good one. (laughs) All right, let's continue. Jesus healed the people of their diseases when they had faith in his power. That's how he did it. He helped them in the things which they could see, thus inspiring them with the confidence in him concerning the things which they could not see, leading them to believe in his power to forgive sins. That's what he offers to all of us. But it, it, it hinges on, on whether we believe him or not. I go back to this all the time, but remember the man with the demoniac son. He said, you know, can you help my son? He's, he's possessed with demons. Jesus said, do you believe? All things are possible to him who believes. And what did the man say? With tears. 
help thou my unbelief. That was reaching up as high as he could and begging God to make up the difference. And God did, didn't he? His son was healed. <clears throat> so this is, what, this is a good way to judge yourself if this is working in your life. Christ Object Lessons, page 384. Again, folks, is it desire to be saved? Is it works righteousness? Love. Love is the basis of godliness. Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. Now, that's a good, great way to test things, isn't it? Because how hard is it to love people right now yeah. in these days? I mean, you think about the 90s even compared to now. Just in this country. If you have God's love in your heart, you will love others. But we can never come into possession of this spirit by trying to love others. What is needed is the love of Christ in the heart. When self is merged in Christ, true love springs forth spontaneously, happens automatically. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. It happens automatically. So, What's stopping you from, from gaining this power? Is there something? Is there a heart sin? Is there an outward sin? Give it to Christ. Give it to Christ. Give it to Christ today. Give it to him now. Now is the time of salvation. Give it to him now. And let him day by day change you. And don't, don't lie to yourself. Don't think God's going to save you with even one sin. He's not. He's not. You have to work on this each and every day. It's not something you do, but it's something that you allow him to do in you. And you have to, you have to submit. I can't submit for you, and you can't submit for me. And I can't read your Bible for you, right? And you can't read your Bible for me. Right? It's called our daily bread, right? Yeah. You, don't call somebody, you don't call your wife right, and say, hey, I'm so busy today. Could you read the Bible for me? I'm too busy. I can't eat. Or, 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 or sorry, to flip it to say, honey, you know, I'm so busy today. I can't eat. Can you eat for me? <laughs> right? That's exactly that's the scenario, right? Yeah. Can you eat my daily bread for me, please? Because I'm so busy. No, you have to partake of it daily yourself. So the Apostle Paul nails it here. Remember, and this is for basically for brevity, I, I've, left, I've, I've left out the other chapter. But the other chapter, chapter 7 of Romans, many of you know, talks about his struggle with sin. And talks about how he sees the other law working in his, in his, his members of his body, the law of sin and death. And he cries out, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And this is the answer right here. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. There is therefore now no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of the life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Is the law done away with there? No, he's saying this is how you keep the law. You see, the law, it can't save you. The law itself can't save you. There's no power there. It points you. It tells you what's going on. And it's weak. It's weak through the flesh because we can't do it. All of our, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. We can't even do something for somebody else on our own without having some selfish motive behind it. We can't. It's not possible. goes on, it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit... The things of the Spirit. For to be, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life 
and peace. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That means, folks, that means as hard as it may be, ministers, gospel workers, whatever the title is, they won't pull punches. They won't pull punches. They will tell the truth to people, just like Ezekiel chapter 33 talks about. From Six Testimonies, page 60 to 61, says the third angel's message is to be given with power. The power of the proclamation of the first and second messages is to be intensified in the third. In the Revelation, John says of the heavenly messenger who unites with the third angel, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 and 2. We are in danger of giving the third angel's message in so indefinite a manner that it does not impress the people. So many other interests are brought in that the very message which should be proclaimed with power becomes tame and voiceless. At our camp meetings, a mistake has been made. The Sabbath question has been touched upon, but it has not been presented as the great test for this time. People talk about the Sabbath, but they don't talk about it as being the test for this time, do they? That the whole world is going to stand or fall on this question, do they? We're not seeing that, we're not seeing that in the conferences. We're not really seeing that in the independents either that much. They're off on their own tangents. They're talking about the Holy Spirit stuff. They're talking about the earth being flat. They're not talking about this. While the churches profess to believe in Christ, they are violating the law which Christ himself proclaimed from Sinai. The Lord bids us show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 1. The sin problem must be dealt with first. And this is how. What I've just told you is justification by faith. It is the very first step that you take towards Christ, and it is the very first step that you need to take every day towards Christ. So it is the message that will give you power and strength to give the third angel's message to lighten up this earth. The Elijah message. The out, this is the righteousness by faith message if accepted and put into practice in your life, is going to prepare you to receive the latter rain. And if you don't do it, you're not going to receive the latter rain. But if you do, you will receive the latter rain, you will receive the seal of God, and you will give the loud cry on this earth. You will be a part of a people that the apostles would be jealous to be, in a good way. We're, we're standing at the brink of eternity right now. I personally think that we're on a lot of borrowed time. I think that we're living in the time when Revelation says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. I think the globalists, the elites, the Vatican, the Jesuits, whoever, the Luciferians of the world, I think they're surprised that it's taking this long to, to finish what their plans are. I think they're surprised. But we know what's going on. Joshua has stopped the sun. So that we can keep fighting. So are you fighting? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this message. We thank you for the power that is in you that makes it possible for us to be the sons and daughters of God. We ask that you would help us, Lord, to make a complete sacrifice. 
that we would let your love transform us, that you would give us that faith that works by love and purifies the soul, that you would write your law upon our hearts and help us to prepare for the perfection that you offer to us. Give us that strength, Lord. Give us that power. And help us, Lord, to be a part of that people that will receive the latter rain and give this loud cry. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.